Welcome back, everybody. And I hope you were able to use the last 60 minutes uh, for a little bit of networking and catching up. I uh, managed to, uh, to look on Twitter and LinkedIn and saw there, there is a debate and discussion going on around a number of the topics. So again, uh, we'd encourage you to, uh, to keep on doing that. Welcome back, unfortunately, to our final uh, sessions of uh, World Energy Week Lead, hard, uh, Week Live. Hard to believe uh, that we've nearly had three days of discussion, insight and networking. But here we are in the last few hours, and I felt it was extraordinarily interesting in the last session where we talked about the uh, World Energy Trilemma Index and where that's likely to go. Some of the discussion there with uh, Angela with regard to recognizing the role of the individual. At one level, we've used the index as a policy gauge in terms of where different countries are. But when we think about the challenge of transition and transformation, we need to get down to the individual. And I think that's a fantastic link now to our next regional session, which is called Active Energy Citizens. Again, that link to the individual at the heart of the energy transition, a regional perspective for Europe. And I'm delighted to hand over now to Jörg Meinbauer, who is the Global Vice President of Power and Utilities at Bureau Veritas. Jörg, over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, the audience. Uh, it's my big pleasure to welcome you today to this panel discussion on uh, the active energy citizen. Uh, my name is Jörg Meinbauer. I'm your, your moderator today. Uh, I'm the Global Vice President for Power and Utilities at Bureau Veritas. Uh, for those who don't uh, know us, uh, BV, uh, Bureau Veritas is an almost 200 years old, uh, 75,000 people strong global subject matter experts uh, organization primarily engaged, engaged in testing, uh, inspection, certification and technical services in a series of industries uh, in the power sector. We have been active since uh, almost a century with a strong refocus on the energy transition, renewables and power grids during the last 15 years. Very happy to be here uh, today um, and, and honored to moderate um, this panel discussion. Maybe be, just before we jump into the discussion, I'd like to frame uh, a little bit uh, the topic uh, we're going to discuss today. Um, consumers uh, or end users are increasingly expected to play a more active role in the energy system. Um, that is, of course, accelerated uh, by the increased use of digital technologies. Uh, but also new forms of using energy. And with its humanizing energy vision, the call, uh, the, the, the council calls for people, such as citizens, customers, and community cooperatives to be more at the center of the energy transition in order to manage the energy system in the best interest uh, of all of humanity. So in today's uh, panel discussion, we're gonna uh, explore a little bit what is going to be expected. Uh, from the future energy citizen, which roles will they play? Uh, what will be the blocking points, uh, the enablers uh, to make this vision finally happen? Uh, and also how we can activate more uh, consumers to be more active. And last but not least, also looking a little bit at uh, the more vulnerable groups in this ecosystem, uh, how can they be involved uh, and also be protected? So clearly a very exciting topic uh, we will be discussing uh, during the next hour. But before we jump into the discussion, I'd like to introduce uh, the panelists uh, I'll have uh, with me here today. I'd like to start with uh, uh, Celine uh, Goelich. Uh, welcome, Celine, today. Uh, Celine is um, a project manager at the 100% Renewable Foundation based in Berlin, uh, calling in from, from Germany uh, today, where she primarily works in the field of digital energy transition. And she's also a co-founder of the Everyone Energy a young startup which develops digital advisory solutions to enable citizens to become an active energy consumer. Welcome, Celine, again. Um, then we have uh, here on the panel uh, Harris Dukas. Um, he's an assistant professor at the uh, National Technical University of uh, Athens in Greece. Welcome, Harris. Nice to have Hello. you. Hello. Welcome. Thank you very much. 
Um, his uh, prime focus is on the uh, design of uh, clean energy and climate policies, a uh, topic very central to the discussion today. Uh, and he's uh, importantly also coordinating uh, the European Power Poor project, which aims to empower energy poor citizens throughout energy cooperative initiatives. Further on, we have um, Fergal Egan here with us today. Uh, nice to have you here. Welcome. Um, Fergal is, uh, uh, with, uh, is a manager at uh, ESB, uh, uh, calling in from Ireland here today. ESB is the Irish uh, uh, grid operator, um, and he's uh, also the uh, manager, project manager of the Dingle project, which is a three-year project, which is coming uh, to the end uh, uh, this year, by the end of the year, uh, which was exploring the impact of renewable and clean energy establishing technologies installed in homes in small business premises uh, and how that could also impact and support local electricity networks. So very interesting view on our topic here uh, also today. Finally, we have uh, uh, Gonzalo Mendes. Uh, welcome Gonzalo also. Um, Gonzalo is a, a postdoc uh, researcher at the, and I hope I pronounced that well, Lappen Ranta Lacht University uh, of Technology in Finland. Um, uh, more precisely at the lab for electricity markets and power systems um, with a background on policy and techno-economic analysis of energy systems. Uh, and important for the conversation today, uh, Gonzalo is also the project manager, manager of the e-project uh, GRITA, Green Energy uh, Transition Actions, uh, which investigates uh, energy citizenship perceptions by diverse communities as well as the drivers and factors that influence its emergence. So another important view on the topic um, here today. So well, welcome all of you. Um, we will start this discussion with uh, an opening statement. I, I'm going to ask uh, each of you sort of as a, as a starting question uh, for today's uh, discussion. Um, we're speaking today about the active energy citizen. So. Um, Let's probably start easily with a definition. So, what would you, what would be your definition of an active energy citizen? And I'd like to to understand from you also if you believe you are one yourself. Um, Celine, you want to start, maybe? Sure, I'd be happy to. So, yeah, thank you very much for having me here, and uh, I'll start right away with what I would define as an active energy citizen. So, I think. The easiest definition is uh, when we talk about consumers who acquire ownership about renewable energy installations. Um, I think this is the standard definition, but to my opinion, there's much more to that, um, especially now, um, since we are not only looking at prosumers, so standard people who would produce and consume energy in the same time, but the market offers more and more solutions that go way beyond the classic electricity market uh, in the sense that it involves um, not only producing energy through photovoltaic on a rooftop, it also includes storing energy, for example, through batteries of electric vehicles. It includes also sharing energy with local peer-to-peer -peer markets. It includes adding flexibility to the market um, from single battery to appliances in the household. And what is especially important to me is that it includes not only the individual level, uh, but also the collective level. So I think if we talk about active energy citizens, we need to talk about communities, we need to talk about renewable energy communities and how we can uh, make them a social practice in the energy system. And with that said, I think that the definition needs to be a bit longer, uh, not only about acquiring ownership about renewable installations, but also um, about acquiring um, ownership across all socioeconomic levels, across individual and collective levels, um, not only in renewable installations, but in the energy market in general. And do you think you are an active energy? Uh, I am actually uh, one of the few here in Germany <laughs> in a city uh, living in Berlin. I actually have uh, the big luck to live in a house with a community PV on the rooftop, but it is uh, still an exception. Okay, great. Good. Um, Harris, do you want to go next, maybe? With your of course, opinion? yeah. As you correctly noted from the beginning, the concept of energy citizenship is still largely ill-defined. I mean, it's understood differently by scientists, policymakers, businesses and citizens due to the variable experience of individuals and organizations in different contexts. 
So energy citizenship generates, for instance, from energy communities and cooperatives to prosumers, to individual citizenship through energy efficiency and energy sufficiency, as well as to energy union citizenship. So promoting energy citizenship within this broad context, especially in Europe, can help, in my point of view, the union to fulfill the promise for a just and inclusive decarbonization pathway through sharing and co-creating new knowledge and practices that maximize the number and diversity of citizens who are, who are willing and able, let's say, to contribute to what we are calling uh, as energy transition. And in fact, this is the challenge to op operationalize this energy citizenship concept at all stages of uh, policy making for decarbonization. And I don't know if I am an active energy citizen, but in any case, I'm trying to teach uh, energy citizenship approaches to my students and promote such policies. Very well, thank you. <laughs> Good, I'll come here to the right, Gonzalo. What's your, your take on this topic? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, from a research standpoint, um, the definition of active energy citizen uh, or, or, or even energy citizenship is a big deal. And it's a, a topic of a lot the, um, to it, um, where a lot of resources are being devoted to. You know? I don't think that should probably be the focus today, going too much into the definitions. Um, but um, uh, for example, the Greta project is now engaged in a, a workshop that is going to be organized with all the leaders of energy citizenship projects in Europe only to discuss the definition. <laughs> um, and, and then you, you ask about a different definition, which is definition of an active energy citizen. In this project, Greta, we have produced a framework, an hypothetical framework, which we will test that uh, accesses the level of involvement or let's say the level of engagement of the citizens in, in energy action, right? And the active energy citizen, let's say, is at one point of that scale, right? So these are the citizens that already take obviously uh, a more active role. They could advocate, they could uh, take certain types of, of action. So the active energy citizen is one that uh, uh, is already at an advanced or um, an advanced level of engagement within that skill. Uh, and then I just wanted to say that energy citizenship itself, uh, um, um, we also have to see that we, we typically talk about energy transition that is our focus, but in fact, energy citizenship is acting towards a particular system of values uh, and a particular system of, of energy policy and energy context around us. Uh, yes, uh, the energy transition decarbonization globally is our main uh, key issue right now, but we cannot forget there are many citizens out there that have a different and diverging view from there. So another goal of this project, Greta, is to make sure we include everyone in the discussion. I think I play my part. I ad advocate to a degree. I teach, um, manage a project on energy citizenship. I drive a hybrid and I try to save as much as possible. <laughs> Thank you. Great. <laughs> Good. Finally, farewell. What's your your understanding of uh, yeah. active energy citizen? So yeah, thanks. Um, I suppose if from a general perspective, I, I think an active energy citizen is somebody who makes decisions and takes actions to have a positive impact on the overall energy system. Coming from somebody who works for an electricity distribution system uh, operator company. I'm really interested in the actions and decisions that they can take that will have a positive impact on the local electricity network. So uh, a lot of the work that we've been doing over the last couple of years has been looking at how you can encourage people to maybe change their electricity usage behaviors to have that positive impact. And that might be, as other people have suggested, changing the timing of when they charge their electric vehicle to off-peak times or maybe the time that they charge their or heat up their water in their home. So it'll have a minimal impact on the, the overall electricity network. But beyond those electricity specific actions as such, um, an active energy citizen could be somebody who shares their experiences, the challenges that they have faced in getting to where they are on that over, overall active energy citizen journey, because it's not one destination that everybody has to get to. Different people will have aspirations to become um, active to a certain degree. So um, 
maybe I have a slightly different view of what an active energy citizen is to some of the other speakers on, on the panel. Um, as regards whether I'm an active energy citizen, um, not really yet in terms of the actions that I've taken. I have home insulation in my property, so I'm reducing my overall energy footprint, but I don't drive an EV. I don't have solar panel on my roof. I cycle a bike on occasions, um, but I tell people about it and I try to to share the, the messages and the positive experiences from the work that I'm doing. So that's as active as I am at the moment. That's a start. That's a start, Fickle. I'd like to um, deep dive on, on, on certain elements here, but I think um, as a start, I think it's it's important for, for our audience here to, to frame the importance of this topic a little bit now, because I think um, everybody is aware of the, the, the big aspiration society is, is going through to, to get to, to, well, Within the next thirty years or, or whatever, to some, to 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 a, to a net zero um, um, global economy. Um, obviously, in everybody's observation on the supply side, there's a lot being done by all the big power companies of the world. Some quicker, some less so. In in, in changing from a more fossil based to to a renewables based um, uh, supply side. Um, but I think maybe it's it's it's, it's less clear uh, for 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 the audience what. Uh, the consumer side can do and 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 why this is so important uh, to be able to 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 be successful in this energy transition. So that would be my 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 first question. Um, maybe you can help help us yeah, to to understand a bit better um, what role this will play in the overall context of things, uh, also compared to what is being done on the supply chain. Um, I don't know who wants to start. Um, Gonzalo, maybe you have a view on that. Or? Sure. Um, well, I guess we're talking about the, the, our importance and what role this will play. Um, well, generally, it's, there's been a realization uh, that uh, uh, the, the progress of the transition cannot take place uh, without uh, without energy citizens. The citizens, uh, um, it simply cannot uh, take place at the pace we want it to take place. Uh, that's that's essentially the big um, the big assumption uh, behind all of this. Uh, we are a little behind when it comes to decarbonization, uh, and the uh, uh, technology uh, assumptions and market uh, so technology and and and, and market based uh, policy making will not alone do the job. We need to involve uh, we need to involve the citizens. Uh, and why the citizens? The citizens. Uh, so let's let's see. Uh, buildings and and houses consume what about a quarter of of uh, uh, energy uh, worldwide? Something like that. So twenty percent or 20, uh, 25 percent. Uh, they they have uh, an important role. There it was. Um, there was. Um, uh, a, a study uh, not long ago that famously claimed that by uh, 2050, uh, some almost 300 million citizens could be producing uh, renewable energy, uh, producing energy at home. Uh, they also mentioned that about 80% uh, or something. Uh, so in terms of technical potential, about 80% uh, uh, of the citizens uh, could be uh, energy citizens by producing um, renewable electricity, by taking, I think they focus also on demand response, so participating in energy market via energy efficiency measures as well, and adopting energy storage technologies. So why? Uh, this is a bit of a low hanging fruit, if it would be that easy, right? We just have to deal with this little issue, which is how we make sure that that potential is tapped. And that is, yeah, the $1 million question. Okay, thank you, Gonzalo. Celine, how would you see that the the importance within yes, the I overall think, energy transition? Yeah, why is I this? Think so? I agree with Gonzalo. Um, the points that he make are very very important. I think that there is another importance in the in terms of potential. So maybe just to add a number on what Gonzalo just said, there is a study that shows that for Germany, if we just take the potential of small scale PVs on rooftops um, on all houses across Germany we could reach 140 gigawatts, which is like a lot of potential because um, this is really uh, something that we cannot ignore as like in the policy dimension. Um, and I see a shift there, so that's, that's good, but I think this potential has to be acknowledged. Of course, it's just one side of the puzzle. And I think we always need to be careful not to 
um, yeah, make it seem like it's the um, holy grail of energy transition. Um, but I think because there is another dimension of potential to this, it can make the energy market fairer, it can make it more inclusive. And especially if we look beyond the single production and electricity uh, sector, if we take into account the mobility sector, if we take into account the heat sector, which are really relevant sectors, if we talk about energy transition, it will just not work without the people. Uh, because we need to uh, make sure that all the EVs that are driving around in the next years um, are infectuated into the system and that we can actually um, use the efficiency and the flexibility they can offer to the market. Same goes for heat. Um, so I think there are a lot of challenges uh, way beyond just like purely production and PVs and uh, windmills and so on that are uh, have to be factored into this. Um, so I would say this is one main reason why it is important and why the potential is so important to reach our climate goals in time. Okay. Yeah, this sounds clearly clearly a, a, a high priority topic. Um, so what does it mean what in terms of expectations? Um, if, if this is so important, obviously we have high expectations towards more and more people becoming um, active energy, energy citizens. What exactly do we expect from them? Uh, I've also maybe maybe some nuances to that. So you were talking about active versus non-active or, or just energy citizen. Um, I've also been asking myself, do I need to know that I'm an active citizen to be one? Um, what, what makes a, a, a what what brings what, what what makes me to be active in this in this whole scenario? So maybe I don't know, Harris, can you can you try to help me understand what what do we really expect from 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 an active energy citizen and, and what what sort of dimensions are in this in this let's say role um, to be summarized? Yeah, yeah. I mean. If uh, you, uh, if we discuss about this transition, it's not a, just an energy transition. It's just not just a technological or even economic transition. It's an existential transition. So, in this respect, when we discuss about the race to zero, decarbonization, carbon neutrality, we need to understand that we have also to secure that uh, it is held with. Uh, Base that is uh, affordable for humans. Thus, this means that we have billions of people that need to be included and play their role within the whole planet. I mean, this uh, transition, and this is not easy. So, enabling enabling more people to understand all these different contexts, which means enabling them people to be energy literate and also enabling them and empowering them to play their role and also the communities to play their role in this major transformation that we have in front of us is the key challenge. And uh, in my point of view, in order to achieve, we need to, of course, be fast, but we need to secure that we are bringing every time as many people and communities as possible. This is why we are discussing about just transition. And for we need to focus also on regions that uh, are having impact, like coal intensive regions. And what are we going to do with uh, people there? And how can we, for instance, transform these regions and these citizens into active energy citizens, even though they need to stop uh, uh, using what they were used to use as energy for many years. Uh, and if I have to say something as a final remark is that uh, it is really important also for uh, policymakers and also for citizens to include when we discuss about models and uh, decision support systems to include and involve stakeholders within our approaches to secure what we are calling as desirability, which means that the pathways that we create for decarbonization are also uh, the de desirable one for citizens. Okay, okay. Um, Fergal, how do you how do you see it? Uh, and maybe let me let me rephrase also a little bit about 
let's assume I, you know, you want me to, to become an active energy citizen. I mean, what would you expect me to do? Um, you know, would you want me to become a prosumer? Do you want me to go to, you know, authorities uh, and engage in policy making? What, what, what do I need to do to qualify in your, in your world as an active energy citizen? Yeah. So I, I suppose, again, from where we're coming from, um, and we understand that there'll be a, a significant transition um, of people switching to electrified motoring and using electricity to heat their homes over time. And it's very difficult to tell people that they need to do that. So people need to be empowered um, with enough trusted information so that they can make the decisions that they believe are right for them, their lives and for their families. Um, and, and one of the things that we're trying to do to enable that is that we've established or we've essentially created a number of very active energy citizens within the project that we're leading. And they're acting as um, exemplars or demonstrations of what an active energy citizen lifestyle could be. So we've equipped a number of people and a number of houses with the full range of technologies from solar to heat pumps to batteries to um, EV chargers. We've provided EVs. We provided home energy monitoring so that people can be equipped with all the information they need to understand about what their energy footprint is. And the great thing about this is these people are keeping are not just keeping the story to themselves. They're telling their story across their community. And we're seeing that that's quite a positive way of getting other people to understand what's involved. So they're hearing about the challenges. They're hearing about the positive impacts. But we don't think that you can actually mandate that people become active energy citizens because not everybody can afford to do it. Um, some technologies cost money, but we think that by creating momentum at community level, that maybe over time that momentum will get to a level that perhaps policymakers can take note and then make decisions to make sure that um, that sort of a transformation can be inclusive for all. Okay, thank you, Fergal. I think that that already leads me to my next question, which is that which is obviously at the at the, the foundation of this discussion. So you you talked about you know activating um, and how and how in that project you 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 produced some examples in order to get some momentum, but I'd also like to get the the opinion from the other ones because I think this is at the core of this discussion. How do you activate people to become active energy citizens? What 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 methodology do we have? What 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 kind of possibilities do we have to to make that happen um Celine, maybe you want to share your thoughts on that yeah yeah sure yeah so just like Fergal, i also think we cannot mandate from people to become active energy citizens but um we should that is at least my opinion definitely create more incentives um again i can look at it from the german perspective where uh, we see that it definitely lacks of incentives, especially on the community level, especially when it gets to cities. It's really complicated to explain to people what the poss uh, possibilities are that they have. So for me, it is definitely a lot to do on the policy side and also on the market side. Um, not so much in creating, um, enforcing people or in like really like um, punishing people who want to take part in this complicated product, but rather in incentivizing um, people and making it much easier to participate. Um, in Germany, the regulations are extremely complex. Um, as soon as we move beyond the classic um, idea of having a house, uh, being a wealthy dentist and um, being able to afford a PV on a rooftop and maybe a battery system. So as soon as we leave this like uh, case, which is, I would say, the most known case, it becomes really, really complicated. And so I think uh, making it easier is uh, really important and um, in order to scale up those solutions, and we have many of them. Um, so this would be the clear task on the policy side, I would say. Of course, subsidies are part of it. Of course, we need to look at markets and um, to which degree do we want to integrate uh, consumers into the market. And we also have to understand that we come from a system where the market is completely closed. And this is definitely a, a hard and difficult task for policymakers also because it needs to happen in the head of people. So they, what you said before, Gonzalo, right? So this idea of values is really important. What kind of energy system do we want to create? Um, 
And this is something that needs to go along with this and we don't have so much time. So it's quite difficult to find the values on the one hand and also to create incentives rapidly as we need it. And I think another dimension um, in order to activate people is really the user experience of the energy transition. And this is something we work on with Everyone Energy, the startup that we've just founded, because we really see that not only are there bad policies or no policies in place, um, but also the solutions that are in the market are so complex and not um, UX friendly at all. So not, there's no like satisfying user experience behind it. And I think this is really crucial for all kinds of companies that work um, in like with consumers to really understand that we need to kind of like have a UX perspective in the market and make it easy. I don't think they need to understand all the technologies in like the depth. It's not it's not necessary. I've unnecessarily uh, the biggest task. I think they need to really see how they can benefit from it um, at like communities and individuals. And uh, it needs to be easy. It needs to be really something that is fun in the end and that can that can have a momentum on that way. Sure. Well, thank you. Um, Gonzalo, how do you see this topic? How would you activate uh, <laughs> energy citizens? Uh, or where do you see the blocking points and, and the potential enablers maybe? Yeah? Oh yeah, we have an idea, uh, but this is where things get uh, very complicated and we are all trying to figure out the way. So uh, I could frame this discussion uh, 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 on the top down versus bottom up. I think uh, that's an important point. Uh, as uh, our, my colleagues already said, I guess uh, two of them already mentioned the fact that top down policies are not very friendly, right? Even though they are well intentioned. Uh, uh, Europe, uh, uh, so the UK, uh, Northern European countries, uh, and a few more have an incredible tradition of grass, uh, an incredible tradition, apologies, of grassroots movement of community organizations that uh, move towards the joint goals uh, from a grassroots, from a, a bottom up uh, perspective. Um, in the Greta project, we are trying to leverage that tradition. We're trying to focus more on energy communities rather than on individualistic action. And that one also exists. Uh, but one key point here is, um, yes, uh, invest, in, uh, invest uh, in communal action, invest in ownership uh, of energy issues. Uh, people want to feel identified. This is our assumption, so that's why you know uh, our project is called Greta for for uh, not uh, not for no reason. Um, uh, it also stands uh, for green energy transition actions, but of course we are inspired by movements that have been grassroots based around the world, and here we can talk about uh, also the impact of social networks, etc., towards climate action and other types of goals. So one key point here, yeah, uh, it is really a uh, uh, move from a paradigm that focuses on top down to, to grassroots movement because people need to feel that uh, um, we care about them. People need to feel that these are their issues and not being imposed by someone else that they've never seen. Um, and I must say uh, that uh, in Europe, for example, not only, but in Europe, we have an incredibly progressive uh, energy regulation at this point. The clean energy regulation, the clean energy package is an incredibly uh, uh, progressive regulation that is very much uh, user centric and towards uh, citizenship action, but uh, the, dec the decarbonization and that action is not necessarily taking place the way we expected or we assumed that it would take place. So what is really missing? And, and what is missing, I think, is, is promoting, um, promoting and, 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 and creating the conditions for this emergence uh, from the bottom up to, to, to take place. And again, that's a million dollar question. It is very complex. We are trying to understand those processes. There are other things here involved, also energy information, uh, uh, communicating of energy issues as well. Uh, we have already mentioned energy poverty as well. This is all interrelated and is from a social technological transition standpoint is very complex, but I would like to highlight, yes, that parting change from top down to bottom up. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Gonzalo, for, the, for this view. Um, another topic which is very often brought into this discussion is, uh, 
technology and and if oh, the digital technologies and data are one of the key enablers um uh, i'd like to understand a bit better is that is that really at the core of the discussion are we talking more about some some buzzwords here here which are you know fancy to discuss on on these kind of uh, uh, occasions i don't know harris do you have any any view on that how important technology is in, in this? yeah technology uh, is very important in terms of uh, providing means for achieving the transition so we need new technologies we need uh, new innovations in order to let's say uh, uh, remove from fossil fuels but uh, it is also important how uh, quickly we will adapt these new technologies. And if we discuss just about introducing technologies, then the, the question, the discussion is maybe isolated. There are many things. This is what we say that we need the system change, uh, and that we say that we need the societal transformation with technologies and other means to enable this uh, transition and. In fact, this is also related with uh, the previous exactly discussion because bottom-up action learning is really important for engaging uh, uh, people, engaging households, and uh, to understand, for instance, what are their bills and what are the technological options that they have uh, uh, in place or they could use and how they can um, proceed with uh, fin new financing schemes that will help them to uh, have new technologies in their households. And this is why uh, within the PowerPoint project, we are uh, setting up a system in place to help people uh, and households understand about, about energy and about technological solutions. We use what we call local heroes that have, let's say, the right knowledge to motivate neighborhoods. And uh, in fact, we have two types of local heroes, energy supporters that engage uh, citizens uh, that may maybe also are suffering from energy poverty. And we pro they provide advice and they help them to plan, secure funding, implement energy efficiency interventions, or try to be prosumers. And we have also energy community mentors that provides support and expertise on how different uh, households and maybe also local authorities can work together and create an energy community, an energy cooperative that can help them, I mean, uh, not only to alleviate energy poverty, not only to uh, lower their energy bills, but also empower them to become uh, prosumers and play their role within this energy transition. Okay. Um, Celine, I think you are quite deep into digital solutions. Um, what's your take on this? How important is this um, in the context of the, the energy citizen? Yeah, I think when we talk about technologies, there are very different dimensions to it. So on the one hand, there is the dimension of the real energy technologies, so photovoltaic, heat pumps, uh, electric vehicles, and much more, um, which is not always easy to explain, especially if we get into the details like metering and stuff like this. On the other hand, um, in order to embrace people um, from the bottom to top, they need to have a certain understanding on this. And I think there's a lot of work to be done in explaining what's going on. So we have to understand we come from a system where um, we are not really energy savvy. We don't really know a lot about energy. Um, and this somehow needs to be overcome if we want to take people um, across all socioeconomic levels uh, from like rural areas to cities, if we want to take them with us and really tap into this potential, we need to do a lot of work in explaining what's actually going on on the technology side, on the regula regulatory side. And for this, we actually need, again, technologies. So we need digital tools to explain it to people. Of course, the human side is very important. So what Harris just said, having community leaders, having people building trust and so on is really important. But especially if you look into cities where most people live in Europe, um, this is really complicated because people have a fast paced life. They are really like busy all the time. So information needs to be 
really available at any time. Um, and this is especially what we are trying with Everyone Energy to build those digital advisory tools for now only in Germany, but of course it would be nice to scale it beyond. And I really think it is important if we talk about technology. So there is this like hard uh, hardware side, then there is the software side where we need to really inform people. And one aspect that is often forgotten, but that is also important, I think is everything that is around like rebound effects. So are we placing technologies like just as we want everywhere? And then as sooner or later, we will experience those rebound effects. And I think this is something we need to, to keep in mind that technology is again, not the holy grail. It is really important. And it's like an important part of the solution to get people on board and of course, to implement the solutions. Okay, thank you. Um, another question I have is, Obviously, somebody needs to drive all this, yeah. Um, so we see there's a there's there's a lot of things to be done in the coming years and and, and then decades, and, and for sure many stakeholders play together. But at this stage, where would you see the the prime accountability to to unlock certain things? You know, are we talking about government authorities? Are we talking uh, about the, uh, the 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 utilities or power companies, uh, uh, grid operators, or um, a lot was spoken about already about the uh, local communities. Um, where do you see uh, the, the prime accountability at this stage of the story um, to, to further unlock um, um, progress? Um, Fergal, maybe you can share some thoughts on that also from your projects um, in, in Ireland. Eh? Yes, so thanks. Um, yeah, accountability, I, I think, is right across the, the energy spectrum, um, both from policymakers to utilities to communities to the individual. And um, we've been looking at a number of initiatives that are that seem to be working well within the, the wider project that we're running. Um, so we see the, the curious energy citizen at the centre learning from his peers and from his from people in the community to understand what they can do to take a next step on the journey. Then we see um, the role that uh, research institutes can play in terms of engaged research um, with people that are taking part in projects, for example, people that are active on, on our project. The researchers are learning what, what, what are the positive steps that need to be taken to diffuse those behaviours across the community. And of course, at a policy level, we know the enabling policies that that are set by government or local authorities to encourage people to take up um, energy technologies, for example, by the provision of grants. But it's it's not it's not just one um, part of the system that will drive it. I think everybody has a role to play. So what we're trying to do in our project is get people to understand at a community level what will help you take the next step forward. And we're trying to build those enablers within the community so that when our project finishes at the end of this year, the community can keep going, that the momentum can be created at that community level and it can take the next step and the next step after that so that more and more people can become active. Okay, thank you. That, that's quite interesting. Um, Gonzalo, from your Greta project, is there any specific insight into this topic? Huh? Well, uh, there is no doubt that we all have a role to play. Uh, there are many different stakeholders and players and actors in this in this change. Um, uh, Greta uh, produces, uh, uh, one of its key outputs is producing policy recommendations. So we, we place a lot of focus on the policymaker. Uh, we were talking about a paradigm change from top down to, to bottom up. It is important that the top part realizes that policies uh, need to change a little bit, right? And um, so that is, I think, uh, perhaps one of the most important enabling players at this point. Um, uh, of course, citizens have a role to play. And then I must say that um, as an active uh, player, in the player uh, as an active individual in the energy sector, uh, you do come across a lot of resistance um, to changing of paradigm, which at this point, I think it is not um, understandable. Uh, I think actors that uh, 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 refuse uh, that change of paradigm, paradigm don't realize the paradigm already changed. Um, 
Uh, and so we need a lot of openness. Uh, uh, I think that, again, on the side of the government and policy making, there's already some humbleness um, in the sense that, hey, we, we realize this, is, this may not be working 100%. Let's see how we can improve. So that's a very positive step. Uh, uh, but now we, we need a lot of reinvention, even from the market, energy market standpoint, uh, a complete reinvention of many business models. A, re a reinvention of, um, for example, on the side of institutional players, you know, legacy players that uh, had quite an important role. Uh, no one is going to deny that, right? Uh, a lot of important role in the past, but then now there's a little bit more discussion on power to the people, you know. So these transfers of power and uh, you know this change of uh, uh, um, this change of player paradigm is creating a bit of tension, uh, as if we have all the time in the world uh, to make the change. We don't, it's already taking place. So what we need really is an open and inclusive environment for everyone to, to come up with, with solutions that uh, obviously serve us all. Okay, thank you. Well, that's a good link to my, to my next question because we spoke at the beginning um, about, uh, let's say more vulnerable groups. Um, I think in that, in that context um, also, Topics like energy poverty come up. Um, I mean, Harris, can you help me to to to, to deep dive on this a little bit? Um, you know, what what is act actually energy poverty? Yeah, I think that's maybe not so not so such a clear concept to everybody. Um, and what does it mean in the context of of active energy citizens? Are there some people out there who are not able to become active energy citizens? What do we do with them? How how are we gonna create a, an inclusive um, a scenario here? Yeah, as most European countries have no official definition for the term energy poverty, this state is more often described as the inability to keep homes adequately warm in the winter and cool in the summer. So even though we are discussing about uh, decarbonization, digitalization, and many other very innovative uh, concepts, almost 7% of people in the EU cannot afford to heat their homes sufficiently, with the highest shares reported in Bulgaria, Lithuania, and unfortunately also in my country in Greece. And consider that uh, nearly, this means that nearly uh, 34 million Europeans uh, are considered to be energy vulnerable, if it's, it's another term. So you can understand that uh, when we discuss about uh, energy transition, we need to secure that we will leave no one uh, behind. This is also the overarching target of humanizing the transition. And this is why energy poverty is uh, really critical. And it is also critical today that we, we discuss since, as you all know, Europe is facing an energy price shock. The cost of natural gas and electricity uh, are up. And uh, these prices are fueling inflation threatening the recovery. And unfortunately, we have winter in front of us in most European uh, countries, and things might get worse, which means that the spectrum of energy poverty may fall quickly across Europe this winter. So we need to secure that uh, we will create, let's say, policies that can help tackling this problem. One, for instance, example is the following, instead of subsidizing, uh, oil or gas for thermal use for poor people, then we can subsidize uh, energy poorer, energy vulnerable households, participation in energy communities, for instance, in a solar park, in some cells, we can subsidize such a participation and thus the clean energy produced from uh, this community, from this solar park, photovoltaic park, could be used for uh, energy vulnerable people heating purposes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's that's very clear. Um, Celine, maybe in, uh, related. Um, in my mind, I think when we talk about vulnerable groups here, um, there's also topics like education, uh, energy literacy, cap capability building, which might play a role here. How how important is that, and what can we do um, on this on this front? Eh? Yeah, I think it's a very important topic and closely related to what Harris said. So 
what we observe um, here in cities when we try to advocate for energy solutions for like multi-tenant houses, for example, from like people would really benefit from it, right? Because the energy um, price is much lower if they actually take a solar price from the rooftop, although the um, regulator, like the regulative solution on this end is still not perfect. It is very, very complicated. But if it's in place once, actually, it's beneficial um, for people, especially for poorer people. And still, it is very important to actually build trust on that end. I think everything that we do in terms of capacity building and providing information in the end it just leads to building trust in order for people uh, who don't have the means to understand those technologies um, can actually embrace it. So I, I think it's a mix of what Gonzalo said earlier in terms of like, building trusts, uh, overcoming all the myths that are still around there. Um, and surprisingly, they are also in the head of not only policymakers, but also consumers. So we see that um, barriers have to build, be built down, not only on the policy level, again, in the head of people, it's a question about values. And I think the best argument to convince people is always, um, you will save money eventually. Um, so this is really something where I think policymakers need to put the focus on to make it not only affordable, because actually renewables are already quite affordable, right? They are very cheap. And the paradox on that we have to overcome here is that although we have the cheapest technology out there to produce the cleanest energy possible, energy prices are still on the rise. And this is really something that is um, yeah, a problem of the energy market, a problem of the system that we have. And um, I guess that, yeah, creating literacy again on that end will help. And um, I think also something that we need to um, yeah, have in mind is all the question of acceptance. Um, we observed this here in Germany that rural areas, especially poor areas, have been used, so to say, to expand renewables on a fast pace. So we have a lot of wind farms, a lot of like PV parks, which are really huge um, in poorer areas here in Germany. And of course, those people are not really happy about it because it's like their rural area that suddenly has all these wind farms and they're not very supportive of the energy transition after all, because we have not created any beneficial policies uh, on that end. And this is really something that we have to overcome. We really have to think that even if we create larger plants, um, we have to think of the people and we have to take them along and create benefits for them. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and I think the point you were making just about the rural areas, there's, there's probably um, a difference of where I sit geographically in, in, in this world. Um, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I live in an urban area versus somewhere in, in the rural area, if I, if I live somewhere where there's a high potential for for renewable energy or versus an area where I have practically a low potential. Um, Faber, from your project, were there any kind of granularity you could see, uh, which is reasonable to explain? Yes, and thanks for giving me an opportunity to talk on this, because um, one of the things that we did on our Dingle project is we worked with a local third level uh, education institute to develop um, a training course um, for what we called local energy mentors. So we provided enough information to people within the community so that they would understand the different technologies. They'd understand the basic concepts around renewable energy and will be able to answer questions for people in their communities that people, so if people expressed an interest and said, oh, I'm thinking about um, insulating my home, what might be involved, that these people will be able to provide the basic information to get people started on for their thinking on it. Because the last thing people want to do is just approach a contractor or a big company initially and feel that they're then forced into accepting whatever that organization says. So um, by having these local energy mentors, we think that it's a great way of building that capability and knowledge locally within the community and kickstarting a safe way for people to ask questions without feeling that they're gonna be forced into committing to a large investment or something if they choose to step back from it. So there's, uh, there's lots of opportunities for, for that sort of education initiative in, yeah. in lots of different areas. Okay, now that's a very, very important point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Look, I need to be conscious of time a little bit. I've got one more question um, before we go into a round of closing statements. Um, now, 
I've grown up in a in a utility world, yeah. So that's that's kind of what I I've known from the past. Now, if I look into the future and we have this army of very large army of of active um, energy citizens around the world, uh, what's going to happen with the traditional operating and business model of utilities? How 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 are we going to make them embrace this topic and and what role they're going to play? Um, I don't know, Gonzalo, you, you have a view on that, yeah? Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, I, I had already mentioned, uh, I had already touched this subject. There is a lot of transformation in the energy markets. No, no, no change about, not, no, no doubt about that. Um, there is going to be more uh, local uh, production, um, citizens, uh, communities. Uh, uh, so, so, uh, the actors on the on the on the the citizen side is are, are going to be able to participate uh, and they are in fact already uh, able to participate in a way but uh, uh, there's the challenges that we've mentioned um, and so there's going to be a lot of change so um, in terms of electricity markets then which is the, the department for which I work with if you if you're calling utilities the the operators, um, you know the transmission system operators uh, uh, are not uh, uh, they're not they're supposed to be mm, to a degree neutral. Um, they may transport less energy, but there's not an immediate uh, enormous uh, threat, I think, to their to their business. In fact, uh, there are uh, important changes that we are studying in several projects at LUT. Where you can seek um, uh, you can seek uh, grid support services from um, the local energy communities, for example, right, uh, such as ancillary services and things like that. That's not necessarily mainstream, but we are studying the potential of this with TSOs that have an open mind and want to study this, these topics. Relates to the previous uh, uh, observation. Um, then distribution uh, operators, indeed, uh, there's. There's some disruptions here uh, in that model uh, because, of course, uh, the more uh, uh, cooperative energy uh, projects and initiatives that you have, then there's a discussion that emerges around who's managing and uh, who's installing uh, 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 local energy networks. Um, then this is a very hot topic, uh, and it has been a very hot topic uh, when it, the clean energy regulations, um, the clean energy package uh, was um, produced across the, the discussion phases. Uh, the operators in Europe played uh, quite uh, uh, an important role and were able to bring in their perspective, which is obviously beneficial. Uh, and it was a very, a very hot topic because the regulation uh, was uh, was um, initially saying that uh, energy communities will be able to 100% manage their uh, energy distribution affairs, <laughs> uh, and, and uh, this created some some tensions. Uh, and now the the resulting regulation says that this is optional for each country to decide. So now in in some countries this is possible, in other countries it's not possible. Um, in my opinion, if you want to know my opinion, I think that DSOs will continue to have a crucial role as they, they always had. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I think they must have, uh, and we want them <laughs> to be part of the discussion. So they, will, they must have. They will survive, yeah. I think they will survive because the grids still need to be managed also locally. Yeah. The one model that is mostly uh, uh, threatened, I think, and needs a lot of innovation is on the retail side. They operate under low margins already. Uh, they may have to seek uh, uh, different models, for example, at the management of local energy affairs, which is something that is emerging within the, the marketplace. Thank you very much, Gonzalo. Uh, we'll need to wrap up in order to be on time for the next session. I'd like to just uh, to close out from each of you have a statement in five words. Yeah, If something would need to happen in the next 12 months to give this a significant push, what would it be in five words? Celine? In five words, that's not, not the easiest, but in I'll one try. Sentence, yeah? I, think, I think the first <laughs> A policy shift and a, and a shift, a uh, paradigm shift, actually. So this is essential in order to bring it on the line. And then um, I think we also need to create benefits for consumers, for communities, especially. So this would be my second word. 
And uh, maybe to end it there, the third word would be user experience, essential and digital tools to, to make it work and to make it work easily and with a little bit of fun. Harris, what would be your five words? Energy doesn't exist objectively. It's a social formation that we've built up in our societies. So without the necessary behavioral and societal transformations that we discussed today, the response to climate change remains inadequate. Very clear. Thank you. Gonzalo, your five words. Five words. Well, what I think needs to take place is the continuation of this debate. Um, we'll make that happen for sure. Open yeah? discussion needs to continue, yeah. And Fegel, you have the last word. Okay, thanks. So yeah, I definitely believe communities can be further empowered to move along the energy transformation and they can work with the DSOs to take out some of the practical challenges that are ahead and for the energy system to be co-created over time. Fantastic. Well, I'd like to thank you very much for, for this uh, debate today. I think it was thank a very you. lively discussion with a lot of important topics. Um, I think to Gonzalo's point, the most important is we take this further. So I'd like to thank also the, the audience for joining us here today. Um, and we're looking forward to meeting with all of you in different contexts uh, to continue this debate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you. you very much. Jörg, thank you very much indeed for uh, a fantastic session on uh, active energy citizens and also thank you panellists for your time and contribution to, uh, to that discussion. I think it's quite extraordinary actually that here we are um, at World Energy Week Live and it's fantastic that we have a session on active energy citizens. Again, I think I've mentioned a couple of times in some of my summary remarks you know, this wouldn't have happened even as recently as uh, two years ago. And I think it demonstrates completely the shift and the change that is happening in our energy system as of today. And again, you, we heard this on day one a little bit with the stories that have been developed with the BBC, where we basically have access to a number of stories that demonstrate the power of uh, basically an active energy citizen and also active energy communities, as was talked about in, uh, in that particular session. I mean, I think, you know, my takeaways from this were the, the first question, and this will be the question to all of you at this moment as well, is uh, are you an active energy consumer? And I think, you know, that is a great question for all of us to take on. And I think if you link that back to the previous session on the trilemma, uh, you know, where the trilemma is likely to go if the ambition uh, is fulfilled, and I certainly hope it will be from the conversation with Angela, is that we do need to now focus on the role of the individuals basically thinking about transition and delegating that responsibility uniquely to policymakers and to government is not going to get us to where we need. We need to be part of that energy transition. And therefore, I think it's a good question to ask us, are you an active energy consumer? And I know from my point of view, I would say I'm a half active energy consumer. And by that, I mean, I have taken steps to ensure that I'm aware of my energy consumption. I have taken steps to make sure Sure that energy efficiency is very much part of my lifestyle now as I go forward. And I have taken steps to understand the power of removal of carbon from the way in which I use energy as a citizen. But there's much more that I could do. But it's not always easy to do that. And I think that's one of the key components that we heard in the session today. I think, you know, we need to recognize that digital is playing a part in the development of the active energy citizen. Why? Because through digital, we now have transparency in terms of the way in which we consume energy. And going forward, with the advent of the prosumer, with the advent of communities and individuals that will contribute energy back into the grid system, we have an ability now to better understand both the supply side of the equation as an active energy citizen, but also the demand as well. And when we think about even 10 years ago, the only way we would have understood anything about energy was an envelope coming 
through our door telling us how much we'd use. No way that we could be active in that domain. But with digitalization brings the opportunity for us to connect and to understand and to access data that we didn't have before. But just accessing data on its own isn't going to make us an active energy citizen. And I think, again, we heard that in the discussion in terms of we need to be able to use that and empower ourselves to do that as we go forward. But there are challenges, I believe, to that. And I think I wrote down the need, the will, and the benefit. In other words, I think we've heard over the last three days that we as a citizen recognize the need to be part of the energy transition. This isn't a delegatable uh, activity. This isn't something that policymakers in their own think tanks come up with. This is something that we can actively engage in. And clearly, we have seen the rise of the activists as a major influencer in terms of the way we think about energy. And each of us as individuals are activists now. We have that possibility and therefore there is a need for us to get engaged. But is there a will to get engaged in terms of the citizen? So we heard obviously from the panel a number of individuals that obviously demonstrate the will to get engaged, but they all recognize that not everyone is the same and not all circumstances are the same and not all endpoints are the same. An active energy consumer in one country could be interpreted really differently in another country, depending on issues associated with access to energy just as a basis for life or energy security if we're in other parts the world as well. So we need to recognize that there probably isn't one endpoint for an active energy consumer as of today. There will be multiple endpoints depending on where we're talking about, what country, what market, what community that we're part of. So I do believe that there is a need. I do believe there is a will. But is there a benefit to all of this? And I do think this is one of the key things in terms of the energy transition discussion is that we need to understand the benefits to this. Yes, there are climate benefits. Yes, there are environmental benefits, but are there benefits to our wallet, to our pay packet in the context of, is this going to cost me more to be an active energy consumer, or is this something that I benefit from? And I agree that if we had a carbon price, and if we could put a price on environmental degradation in a way that would impact our pay packet, then we would perhaps be more motivated to take action. But again, I do think that is one of the aspects that needs to be thought through as we think about this over the course of the next number of years. But I do think one of the things that came through is that the changes and the technological changes and, if I can call it, the complexity of the energy system that is likely to emerge do create this phrase that was used on day one, which I, I loved, which was basically the demo democratic energy systems are emerging. And that's because we have what was called in the previous session an and, and, and energy system. These are not binary systems. You know, we get our electricity from coal or gas. Nowadays, we have the opportunity to get our access to energy from multiple sources. And those multiple sources can be large in terms of where they come from, gas deposits, for example, or they can be small, which is photovoltaic on your roof. And as a consequence of that, we now have more choices available to us in the context of energy transition. Those choices in have a potential to create a more democratic energy system. That more democratic energy system leads to the opportunity for active energy citizens as we go forward. But we need to make that user experience, which was one of the final points that was mentioned, easier. The user experience at the moment, if it's top-down driven, tends to be quite cumbersome. And that was the view of all of the panelists. And we need to engage with those communities and with those individuals, leveraging new digital tools that are available to make our participation in the energy system much easier than we find it today. So again, thank you all for your session. Thank you, the panelists. I found it a very interesting session in terms of setting out a context for change, setting out a context for dialogue, and setting out a context for a new narrative that we need to take into the energy systems debate over the course of the next 10 years. Once again, thank you. We're going to take a quick break now up until uh, five minutes time. Uh, we'll be back at uh, quarter to three uh, London time, 14.45, uh, where I'll be uh, moderating our final uh, session of the day, uh, whereby we'll be uh, talking about, let me get the title right, <laughs> Tipping Points and Transitions to 2040. Uh, we have a fantastic panel and I hope to welcome you back in five minutes. Thank you.